kiddos take off. Okay, youth night this Friday at 6 o'clock. Oh, some crazy people are going to play hockey tomorrow night if anybody wanted. 6 to 8. So a fight will break out about 6.30, and they'll call it a hockey game. So, John 4. John 4. I'm going to preach on the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle, which turns around, and if you believe the greatest miracle, turns around to be the greatest blessing to God. John chapter 4. Verse uh, 43. Okay, it says, Now after two days he, he, Jesus, departed thence and went into Galilee. Okay, that's north Israel. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. So that's where he's at, in his country, up, own country. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. Okay, that's back in chapter 2. That's when he gave his first public miracle of turning water into wine, or what's commonly in the Bible called pure blood of the grape. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Okay, so uh, kind of the uh, upper crust guy in society, nobleman. And when he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Okay, that's a common saying. Seeing is believing. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down here, my child dies. So he ignored the comment, and he, this guy is panicked. This guy is desperate. His son has died. He's called all the, all the doctors. Nothing's working. He heard about Jesus Christ, and so he's saying, That's, that's my last hope. Verse 50, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. I'd like to go to a doctor like that. Walk in the office, okay, get out of here, you're okay. And notice the guy's response. And the man believed the word. He had no evidence of it. They didn't have a cell phone and say he's better. He believed the word that Jesus has spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he himself believed. Yeah, he already did up there in verse 50. It's just a little bit different. Verse 53 and his whole house, so his wife, kids, everything. And this is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. And if you would, let's go and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this idea. Help us recognize that uh, miracles are, from our perspective, a big deal. From your perspective, no big deal. And I pray that you'd help us to see what is the greatest miracle. And then if we believe that... Uh, turning around to be the greatest blessing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so you uh, read the storyline as I did, and uh, as a guy who's got a sick kid, kid's bad sick, heard that Jesus uh, could heal him. Uh, he came to Jesus. He said, heal my son. Jesus said, okay, get out of here. He's, you know, he lives. And the guy said, okay, I believe you. And he went went home, and this is what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So he gets home and he looks back and, okay, that was the time. And now he has a different form of faith, bigger, greater faith. Okay. And then it says, this is a second miracle in verse 54. Uh, there are a lot of different reactions to the paranormal, what's called paranormal, supernatural, uh, things like that. People have a lot of different reactions. Uh, 
people are mystified by it. Uh, the mystic of the supernatural uh, mesmerizes a lot of people. Uh, some people try to ignore it, but it's about everywhere. And I bet you if we took some time and asked you if you had or know of some strange experiences, I'd probably hear some things. I've heard a lot of things. Uh, some really strange stuff. Uh, I've experienced some pretty strange things. Uh, the, the draw that self-styled Satanists, young kids that go around pretending that they're, they're Satanists, haha, uh, they, they get a thrill out of some, you know, seance, you know, or something like that. You come down to Rensselaer, you get on Moody Road. If you go a certain direction, certain east, then you'll see this light come up and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. A lot of people in Rensselaer talk about it. I mean, all this kind of stuff is everywhere, and it's really not that big of a deal. But people often get mesmerized by the paranormal, and they get their focus off the right thing. Now, the word miracle, okay, the word miracle and its plural form is found 37 times in the Bible. And a miracle, from our perspective, is something that's not normal. It's out of the norm. It's outside of our natural realm. We don't see those things too often. Okay? And when a person does see it or experience it, you kind of got to shake your head and wonder, what was that all about? Okay? And in the dark world, the kids, you know, getting in the dark world, they don't realize that they're messing around with a snake that wants to uh, kill them. That's his ultimate goal. I talked to a guy in jail years ago. He said he was a Christian. He said his friend was a Satanist. He thought his friend was a pretty nice fella. And I said, yeah, and your friend will cut your throat when he gets the opportunity, if the devil allows him to. And he said, yeah, he told me that. I said, my, that's a nice fella. Why? Just don't go to sleep at night around the guy. Okay, but again, he thought that was cool. You know, Satan, I've talked to Satanists in jail on several occasions. And it's not that big of a deal, okay? Uh, this spirit world and these paranormal stuff is not, is, is, it's out there, it's common, UFOs, all this kind of stuff, it's out there. And when I've had people tell these, uh, some of these things to me, some of them are tripping on drugs. Some of them uh, had the experience in their bed, some had it in, in church. Uh, watch Christian television, you can see a lot of strange stuff. That passes off at Christianity. And it's no more Christianity as than the moon is green cheese. But um, people get fascinated with these things. You know, the first time the word miracle is found in the Bible is found in Exodus chapter 7, verse 9. And that's when Moses was pulling Egypt, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. And he was, he was given by God three miraculous things that he could do uh, to convince the Jews we need to get out of here. And... Pharaoh's magicians could do the same thing. Which one's right? Which one's right on that thing? Uh, when Jesus was uh, passed off by Pilate to Herod, because there's different jurisdiction, it says that Herod wanted to see some miracle. And Jesus Christ didn't show him anything. He said, Get out of here, child. Didn't even talk to the guy. Said nothing to the clown. And then he passed him back to Pilate. You see, people tend to be fascinated with a miracle rather than the God of the miracle. There's a difference there. Okay, the fascination is directed toward the act rather than the actor. The worship is directed toward the creation rather than the creator. Climate change. All a, it's all a farce. It's a farce. It's a bunch of socialists who are trying to enslave this country. And they are worshiping the creature more than the creator, the animal rights activists. But they'll kill an animal as quick as they need to if their life is in danger. They go to a doctor and say, you got parasites. What do they do? They'll take a drug to get rid of the parasite. All that endangered species. I mean, you need to let it go. Let it eat your brains out. It's only got one little small meal. I mean, all that stuff, uh, people are worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Okay, and 
People forget or don't realize, maybe they don't realize, that Satan has many of the similar abilities that God has. And a miracle is not that big of a deal. A miracle is nothing more than a higher law overriding a lesser law. That's all that a miracle is. Okay, we living in the natural laws, the natural world, when a supernatural law overrides a natural law, we say that's a miracle. From God's perspective, that's just normal. From the devil's perspective, that's just normal. Okay? Uh, people see some of the things my, my wife does in healing techniques, and they say, what is going on there? You can't see anything, but from experience, I know that it works. As far as energy that in our hands, where like my rotator cuff would take about six to nine months recovery, and she fixed it on Tuesday, and I'm fine and dandy on Wednesday. Why? Because some of us have experienced these things. And it's not faith healing, because I never gave a seed faith vow. And I ain't given her one either. But still, the idea is a miracle is a higher law overriding a lesser law. How can a huge airplane, with all that weight, override density? Okay? They call it gravity, but they can't explain gravity. Density is anything that's lighter than air floats, a helium balloon. That's not normal. But it is with, it is with helium. Another balloon, it drops because anything heavier than air drops. Anything lighter than air lifts with the exception of aerodynamics with wind coming over the wing, compressing the air, creating lift. And that's a higher law overriding a lesser law. But isn't it amazing to go to an airport and watch them big birds come off the ground? It's fascinating. It's not that big of a deal. God created birds years ago, and man tried to figure it out. It took him about 6,000 years to figure it out, but he got to figure it out. That's all that a miracle is. Some people have experienced uh, uh, surgeries where their body came out, and they're looking over. They're not lying. They've stepped into the spirit world. God allowed that. And in the Bible, whenever anybody steps from the spirit world into the physical world, it's like a common joke. They always say, peace be unto you. Like, man, you scared of me to wits, and you're saying, peace be unto you. Yeah, it's easy for you to say. Okay, it says in Colossians 1.18 that Jesus, 116, that Jesus Christ created the visible and invisible. Invisible is in the supernatural world. Now, the word miracle, you'll find it in the Bible 37 times. You'll find it 57% of the time in John and Acts. So we read one here in John chapter 4, verse 54. And I'll give you some thoughts about miracles first off this morning. Miracles are scriptural, viable proof to Jewish people under the Old Testament covenant. Okay, that was scriptural, viable proof to Jewish people under the Old Testament and to the Jews in the book of Acts because it's called the Acts of the Apostles. They could expect that. Because in the Old Testament, simplistically, it was seeing is believing. In the New Testament, believing is seeing. It's different. We live by faith, not by sight. And so the idea of, if you remember some of the Old Testament history, God told a guy named Moses, I want you to lead this nation of people, a bunch of these people, about three million, two to three million people, I want you to get out of Egypt. And he said, how am I going to convince three million people to follow me out of Egypt? He said, oh, uh, you got something in your hand? You got a rod in your hand. You look like an orchestra conductor there, Mo. And he says, take that thing and throw that on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it turned into a snake. He said, now pick that thing up. I would suggest by the tail. And he picked that thing up and it turned back into a rod. He said, that's one trick we got for you. And the second trick is, he said, okay, now Moses, take your hand, stick it in here like Napoleon. You know Napoleon, Mo. He said, no, no, that's future, God. Okay, yeah, okay. You know, stick your hand in here like that. Pulls it out, becomes a leprous, gangrene, whatever. And Moses is scared, trying to get that away from him. He says, stick it back in there. Stick it back in there. And it came out as a gift of healing. He said, now there's another trick we got for you. 
And then he says, now take that water you got right there and throw it on the ground. And it turned into blood. So he had three miracles. From God's perspective, not a big deal. But you know, when he pulled those things to Egypt to try to convince it, the magicians could do the same thing. The only is, thing is that Moses, King Cobra, ate their snakes, and they didn't get a chance to get theirs back. But still, the idea is that we need to recognize that there are some paranormal circumstances, and you need to recognize that God may be involved, but there's somebody else that may be involved. And we need to recognize that. In the Old Testament... Uh, the Jews, because of that beginning, they basically could tell God, in order to convince me that what you said is right, I want a miracle. Gideon did that. Hezekiah did that when he told Hezekiah, you're going to die. And he said, can I have some more life? He said, well, okay, I'll give you 15 years. He said, prove it. He said, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I'd like you to move. If I ask you to move the sun forward, eh, that's not that big of a deal. Make, make it go backwards. So I moved the sun backward. You say, that's a miracle. Not really. Okay, a watchmaker creates a watch. And he's got that watch, and if you pull the old watches, if you pull the little knob out, you can make time go backwards. Why? A law overthrew the tick, 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 tick law. Okay, and that's what the watchmaker created. The watchmaker, he can make his son go this way, he can make it go that way. It's not a big deal. Our perspective, it's a big deal. Okay, that's the God of the Bible. Under the Mosaic Covenant, seeing is believing. In the New Testament, believing is seeing. You'll get some evidence after the fact. And that's where it gets into the apostolic signs. Okay, so the th second thought is this. Miracles can cause viable problems to truth. They can. They can be a problem to truth. Why? Because people aren't looking at it properly. Okay, I had a lady showed up at Rensselaer one time, and she said, I, I want to tell you something. I said, okay. She said, I'm laying in bed, and I looked at my ceiling, and I see a silhouette of Jesus on the ceiling. She said, what do you think it was? I said, oh, probably a silhouette of Jesus on the ceiling. You know, I just didn't really get into the, the excitement about it. And she goes, well, what do you think it meant? I said, I think it meant that there was a silhouette of Jesus on your ceiling. And she said, well, there's got to be a meaning to it. I said, well, probably the meaning is that there's a silhouette of Jesus on your ceiling. And she said, well, I think it meant I was special. Ha, huh, now I see where we're going with this. Maybe you just had the wrong pizza late at night. You know, okay, another story. I had a fella down there at Rensel Tuck, and uh, he got some strange things going on down there. And I uh, had a fella that could, uh, he was a trapper. He could trap fox and catch foxes pretty good. And he got this secret from his uncle. But his uncle said, now you promise me you won't tell anybody this secret except your son. And so uh, he told his son the secret, and this guy was quite a trapper. He could catch fox like crazy. And he told a friend. And he lost the ability to catch foxes. And his uncle happened to pass away. That was the guy he made the promise to. Now, this is a fellow that went out to the cemetery and talked to his uncle. Now, I, he was talking to a gravestone. But after he talked to his uncle, he apologized. He, he went home, he got to bed at night, and his uncle showed up on the foot of the bed. And he apologized to him. And whoever was at the foot of his bed told him what he should do. And he started catching fox like crazy. What was that? He asked me that question. What was that? I said, oh, it's easy. That's the devil. Why would it tell me the truth? That's a hook to reel you in. And when he reels you in, that's where you see some of these stories where people said, it just came over me. I couldn't help but kill the guy. They'd been hooked in a long time. 
and he's just reeling them in. The devil tells the truth when it suits his fancy, like a lot of people I know. You see, and that's paranormal. I didn't say he was a liar, and I believe the experience. A lot of people told me some strange stories, you know, and I believe these experiences. I'm not saying they're lying at all. I'm saying we got to look at it and look at it in the light of the Bible. You see, the heart of man can allow a miracle to subtly transfer the admiration of God to the miracle itself. Read about Our Lady of Guadalupe. Read about Fatima, where Mary showed up to three Portuguese children and told them about all this stuff. She's always got a big flashlight. I can never figure that out when you read what's going on. Oh, read about uh, the pitcher that cries. Or this one lady had a piece of toast that had a silhouette of Jesus in the piece of toast. What a miracle. Oh, I mean, you got all sorts of stuff. But you see, these miracles can cause problem because people get infatuated with the paranormal. And be it good, be it bad, a person better watch out. Because one's fascination will lead to another fascination until you're desensitized. The children of Israel watched those ten plagues. They watched ten plagues. They watched the, the after effect of a death angel coming in, the grim reaper coming in Egypt and killing every firstborn. Then they watched this water being parted as they walked across, and they're still griping to God. With all that going on. You would have thought they would have gotten convinced. But the tragedy of unbelief leads a person down a wrong road. The first time God spoke to, to Jacob in the Old Testament, he, Jacob called that place Bethel. Okay, Beth means house, El means God, so that is house of God. But Jacob got out of fellowship with God, and then later on, he had a meeting with God again. You know what the second time he called it? El Beth El. Instead of the house of God, he called it the God of the house of God. A lot of people say, well, you should go to church. What if God's not in the church? What if he ain't going to show up? Better find a church that God's going to show up. A church that his book is preached. You know, these churches nowadays, if Jesus Christ showed up and if they knew who it was, they'd boot him out. They don't want to hear what he's got to say. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah stood in front of the Jewish temple. He said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You're listening to lying words. It's the Lord of the temple that's important. It's not the church that's important. It's the God of the church. That's important. And in the Baptist realm, if they get a big church, they say, he's a great man. I don't know about that. Then Joel Holstein's pretty great. I don't think he's much of a man. How about he's a man of a great God? Or we put it that way. Thomas Erkshein said, he was a Scottish theologian, he said this, those who make religion their God will not make God their religion. And that's the subtle nature of it. Miracles can be a deceptive ploy by Satan in order to deceive people. The entire charismatic movement, watch it on TV. All the clowns aren't in the circus. Most of them are on Christian television. Watch these clowns. And some of it, some of it's faked, but a lot of it's a spirit. And it's not the right spirit. Okay, let's go to our Bible and get a little verification of that. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 11. I've said that on the radio several times. He's been, oh, he's committed the unpardonable sin. So I'll, I'll commit it again right after that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at this one, verse 13. For such are false apostles. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That angel of light, that's the God of Freemasonry. 
They think Lucifer's the good God and Adonai's the bad God. The worship of light. That's the God of the Illuminati. That's why the Illuminati will have the, the pentagram with the goat horns. That's why you see 666 everywhere. If you know what you're looking for. That's why a church down there between DeMott and Wheatfield has 666 on their marquee. Oh, it's three circles. You know, it don't look like 666, but it is. It's an esoteric 666. That's why everywhere you go, you can see it. You go to their grocery store and you get a UPC symbol coming across. It's got two lines in the front, two in the middle, two at the end. And that's the representative of six and six and six. You see, the devil is infatuated with the Bible. And he knows the Bible very well. And he is marking his territory. That's why that monster drink, them three uh, squiggly lines, is how a Jew writes 666. That's why you get on the internet and you put www at the beginning of your internet address. And that's the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that's 666 right in front of us. This paranormal stuff is all over the place. And it shows, the power, first off, the power of God, but also the deception of Satan. How is he going to deceive people in the tribulation time period? Revelation chapter 13 shows us how. How is a man in a tribulation time period going to get people to take the mark of the beast or the number of the beast? Man, that's no problem. Just put it by this tattoo. People have come accustomed to it. No problem. How's he going to get to do this? Revelation 13, verse 13, double negative. Chapter 13 got 18 verses, which is three sixes. You find that three times in the Bible. Genesis 13's got three sixes, 18 verses. Deuteronomy 13's got the same. And it says, He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them by, that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do, and so forth. Lightning. Lightning bolt. This is why Kiss had lightning bolts. This this is why the SS of the stormtroopers of Nazis had lightning bolts. Jesus Christ said, I saw, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. And when the Antichrist is on earth, when he gives a public speech, if somebody protests his speech, he could say from the podium, may, if I am not true, if I am true, may God strike you dead. And all of a sudden lightning comes down and there's a guy fried to a crisp. I mean, that's pretty convincing. That's the kind of power he has. And people forget that. What tells us about this power? That book. That book tells us about that. If you would look in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Peter. There's a fellow in the Bible that had a very strange experience. The most strange I think anybody could ever experience. Okay, it was a public, it was a vision that he had. And uh, this guy's named Peter, and his two friends, James and John, and they walked on the top of this mountain, went to the top of this mountain. Jesus Christ said, I want you guys to go with me. So they went to the top of this mountain, and while they're on top of this mountain, Jesus Christ looked majestic. Majestic, he, he looked uh, transfigured. He looked real bright and shiny like he's a king. And then, then these two guys show up from the air or somewhere. And then they find out that's Moses and that's Elijah. I read about you guys. So here, the Apostle Peter is with Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah shows up. A voice, a booming, thunderous voice said from heaven, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now that's what, and then when they came down from the experience, Jesus said, Okay, fellas, don't tell anybody what you just saw. You got to be kidding me. I mean, I can get on Christian television and make a bunch of money off that, Lord. I mean, that's better than a 900-foot Jesus. He said, nope, don't tell anybody. So Peter's writing about that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, uh, starting about verse 14. So he's writing about that experience. And he said this in verse uh, 13. Uh, Verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He saw it. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. 
I saw it, I heard it. Right, James? That's right. Right, John? That's right. Right, Moses? That's right. I mean, that's the most authentic vision anybody's going to ever have. And look at verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. I got something better. What is it? Verse 20, Scripture. That book. Because that book shows you if the experience was real or... I mean, it was real if it was from God or if it was from devil. That's what that book. This right here is more sure than Fatima. Than Our Lady of Guadalupe. Than the silhouette in the ceiling. Then my uncle showing up at the bedside. This is more sure. This book right here. And you see, the greatest miracle ever known to man is when the Word became flesh. That's the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is when Jesus Christ became God, became man. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh. That is the greatest miracle right there. That is, that is like a little boy playing with his G.I. Joes, and he becomes a G.I. Joe, one of the little toy soldiers. He puts himself into the toy soldier, and then all these little G.I. Joes get together and crucify him. And he died for all the other G.I. Joes. That's what Jesus Christ did. That's the God of the Bible. That's the greatest miracle. And when a person rejects the greatest miracle, the greatest punishment is going to follow. You see, that, that's the evidence right there. The greatest, you see, when God begets God, what God begets is God, just as what man begets is man. What God creates is not God, just as what man creates is not man. If I draw a picture, that picture's not man. The pantheists are wrong. You see, the great miracle enters into the little by descending in order to ascend. Jesus Christ, the greatest miracle ever known to man. And if you would look at John chapter 20. The greatest miracle known to man is that Jesus Christ walked this earth and then man killed him. In John chapter 20, after the uh, crucifixion, uh, Jesus uh, <clears throat> went to heaven, came back, uh, did a couple things, and then he showed up with the apostles, okay, in John chapter 20. He showed up with the apostles, and Thomas wasn't there. I don't know, he was out, you know, at some convenience store. I don't know, he's late. I don't know where he's at. And then when he got back, the apostles, Peter, James, John said, Hey, you wouldn't believe who just was here. Well, who? Jesus Christ was just here, our Lord and Savior. I don't believe you. You're lying. Bunch of liars. He said, I don't even believe you guys. He said, I, I got to see it to believe it. I want to see his hands. I want to see his feet. I want to be able to put my hand in the side. Eight days later, he showed up. And you know what first thing Jesus said? Hey, Tom, how you doing? Looky here. Now, how did he know he said that eight days before when he wasn't around? Or maybe he was. That's the God of the Bible. And notice Thomas's response after he saw that. Verse 28, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God, right there in front of us. And verse 29, Jesus said, hey, there's something better, my friend, something better. He said this, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet. You see, the greatest miracle is that Jesus Christ became flesh. But you know what the greatest blessing of God is? Believe in Jesus Christ. That's the greatest blessing of God. And God will get 
give you a blessing because you accept his blessing. Believe God, not believe in God. Believing in God is different because that's what devils do. To believe God. If you got a fascinating experience in your life and you just couldn't wait to go tell your friend about this experience, and man, you are all excited and you're telling this story to this friend. And after about five minutes, man, you are so wound up, excited. You're waiting for their response. And they say, you liar. I don't believe a word you said. I don't think you're going to be real happy with your friend. I don't think, I think it's going to be a little problem here. You see? But you know what most people do when they read what God says? You liar. I don't believe what you said. Most preachers say that. In this country, most of them do that. They're calling God a liar. There was a fellow years ago, he was in his 70s, no children, in his 70s. His wife was 60, and he and God had a meeting, and God said, oh, by the way, uh, you're going to have a bunch of kids. You're going to have some kids. Really? Oh, okay, I believe you. And God says, you do? That's surprising. You get that out of Hebrew. You really study that. And you know, that man is one of the most blessed men in the Bible because he believed God in spite of the circumstances. He believed what God says. And that's Abraham. There's another fellow where the ship is getting ready to go down because a great big hurricane came in, Euroclidon. 276 guys on, on the boat. And an angel showed up and told Paul, he said, uh, oh, by the way, uh, ship's going down, but everybody's going to survive. All 276 are going to survive. And Paul says, oh, okay. And then he got in front of the guys. And he said, oh, by the way, fellas, uh, angel showed up tonight. Talk to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. what you been drinking? What you been smoking? Uh, he said, well, he said the ship's going down. He said, but everybody's going to make it. He said, and I believe God, even as it was told me. And now a bunch of them didn't believe that because they tried getting on a lifeboat, tried getting out of there. And when he got to the shore and they counted all the men coming in, 274, 275, 270. Paul says, I told you. I told you. And God in heaven says, that was a blessing. That guy believed me. Abraham, that guy believed me. The greatest miracle ever known to man is when Jesus Christ became flesh. And then he offered himself. And when a person believes in that miracle, God in heaven says, wow, that's a blessing. And because they believed in that, that I'm going to give them eternal life. Man, ain't nothing better than that. The greatest blessing here to us, or the greatest miracle from our perspective, is the greatest blessing from God's perspective. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that by chance, if someone has never placed their faith in Jesus Christ, to believe in Him, to agree that He is the only Savior, I pray they'd realize that if they did that, they would honor God. They would honor Jesus Christ. Not to believe in Him just to save me from uh, hell or destruction or anything like that, but to believe in Him because He's worthy to be the Savior. And if somebody is here not certain they're going to heaven and they are concerned about that, I pray that they realize that belief in Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, and resurrection, when they place their belief in that, God in heaven will be so overjoyed and blessed that He will throw eternal life and write their name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Nothing better than that. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. If you are not saved, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have, obviously, we'd love to show you. Piano will play, the altar's open. If you want somebody to show you, nobody's looking around, you can raise your hand and I can have somebody to show you. And you can honor God. 
believe in Jesus Christ, the greatest miracle will give the greatest blessing to God himself. Belief in him. Rejection of Jesus Christ is why the greatest punishment ever known to man will be laid out there. Lord, I do pray and ask you to help us to be a blessing to you. So many, so many are looking to be blessed. Help us look to be a blessing to you by believing in the greatest miracle ever shown to man when the Word became flesh, Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd help us to, in return, be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.